I'm certainly glad to see each one of you here for this important chapter, Revelation 12, there in prophecy. Years ago, we lived in a country home that we just loved. For 16 years, the property and the house served us just perfectly. But then a severe drought came and it dropped the water table lower than it had ever been before in recorded history. And the ground itself began to shift. And one day we noticed that our basement floor was wet and cracks began to appear on the basement wall. My wife had a printing business. It was in the basement, so wetness was a big problem. I, don't, I didn't know what to do. I wondered if there were actually people that would work on foundations because it appeared to be a foundation problem. To my surprise, I looked in the phone book, this was before internet, and there were pages on pages of foundation specialists. I didn't even know where to start. So I called the first five that were listed, made appointments to have them look at our house foundation and see if there was something we could affordably do to fix the problem. The first appointment was with Briggs Basement and Foundation Repair. Mr. Briggs came with a book of glowing testimonials and he had about his work and he had damning comments about the other people who claimed to fix foundations in the Wichita area. That was sold. His process of using pressurized concrete seemed to be great. I didn't even think we needed to talk to anybody else, but I'd already had four other appointments, so uh, these were all lined up. I decided to keep these prior appointments, though I believe we would go with Briggs. But after the next presentation, from the next foundation company, I became a little bit confused. This foundation specialist had a completely different solution it seemed to me just as reasonable as Mr. Briggs. And the owner, too, had a long list of glowing testimonials and damning comments about other companies uh, that claimed to do foundation work, including damning statements about Mr. Briggs' work. And so it went. Every company claimed their method was superior, and they explained why it was the best and better than others. And they all had their glowing testimonials of their work and damning solution, their damning statements of other companies. This continued until I saw the fourth and last, fifth and last presentation, Atlas Piers. And they had a completely different method for foundation repair than any of the others. And when I heard their solution, I knew we finally had the right company. And we went with them and it solved our problem. My experience was much like those who are trying to find a church home. Perhaps they experience a spiritual drought in their life and they have some unsettling experiences. Their foundations begin to crack. And in this crisis, many seek a church. Perhaps they try the one that's close or one that a friend suggests or maybe one that they grew up with as a child. If they look on the internet, they find a plethora of churches surrounding them. But which one to go to? They may call and make an appointment with a pastor or a priest, and he'll tell them all the advantages of his church. He might have testimonials, and if asked, he might be able to give some damning comments regarding neighborhood churches. And it may be convincing and sound right until you ask the next pastor. And soon you're confused. Why did I go with Atlas Pierce? The representative from this company explained that our problem with the house was because the foundation was not resting on rock. Bedrock was actually 25 feet down. And to my surprise, that I learned, I learned that my house was built on sand. And Atlas Piers put down pillars to the solid rock layer far below. It established a house foundation supported by bedrock. And the method worked with our house. We had no further issues with the foundation, whether there was drought or flood. I resonated with their plan because that was the plan of Jesus. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house. In our case, the drought came. And it did not it would not fall 
this house, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. Notice how the Bible simplifies life. There are only two foundations to build our life on. We either build our life on a secure foundation, the rock of God's word, or we build our life around the shifting sands of man's opinion. Everywhere here, everywhere there, people have opinions. But only God's word has a secure foundation. And everyone here and everyone in Chattanooga, everyone in the entire world is building their life either on one or the other of these two foundations, God's word or man's opinion. And while our foundation will reveal our destiny, interestingly enough, our foundation also reveals our parentage. God explains this in the very first chapters of the Bible. Immediately following their creation, God told Adam and Eve, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. If Adam was wise, what would be the foundation of his life? If Eve was right, was, uh, was wise, what would be the foundation of her life? The sure, immutable word of God. But there was an enemy to the word of God. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Did Eve remember God's word at that important time? She did. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it lest you die. Did Eve understand that God had said there was death in eating a particular fruit? Yes. If Eve had been wise and built her life on a solid foundation, what would she have done? She Obeyed God's word. But notice that the words expose the serpent. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. See, the serpent denied that there was any severe consequences in disobeying God's word. And whenever we hear someone or something, or anyone, discredit the consequences of breaking God's law, we are hearing the echo of the serpent. In place of Jesus and his word, the serpent was offering a different foundation for Eve to build her life upon. And then the serpent continued, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The serpent not only claimed that nothing drastically severe was going to happen from breaking God's law, he confidently asserted that breaking God's law was actually going to bring great good. And the watching angels must have held their breath. Would Eve build her life on the rock of God's word or on the sand of the serpent's words? What did Eve decide? Sadly, Eve decided to build her life on the seeking quicksand of Satan's promises. Eve didn't sin alone. We never do. Just as Satan spread his sin to angels and then to man, when she spoke to her husband the next time, she looked like a lamb, but she spoke like a serpent. And she spread her sin to her husband. We should pause here for a moment. At the very beginning of the Bible, we discover the power of influence. Friends, marriage partners, even strangers like the serpent, have a, a great influence on our decisions. We are like sheep. We follow others who seem to confidently lead. But it's only safe 
to follow Jesus. How tragic. There are multitudes who choose death over life through the influence of a wife or a husband, a son or a daughter, a friend, a relative, who encourages them to build on the faulty foundation of disregarding God's commands. It never pays. Just as sin, Satan was cast out of he his heavenly home for his disobedience, Eve and Adam were cast out of their palatial garden estate as a result of their disobedience. They lost their garment of light and felt a sense of shame. They would now have inconvenience and difficulties in this life with toil, hardship, pain, blood, sweat, and tears. The serpent, Satan, did not escape punishment for his deception. He was cursed. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Satan had already been banished from heaven. But ultimately, God was telling Satan he would be banished to this earth and his deceptions confined to this earth, and ultimately he would bite the dust. Then God gave a prophecy to encourage his people to the end of time, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and, his, uh, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God here declared that down through the millennia of time, there would be only two races of mankind, the children of the woman and the children of the serpent. God said that there would be a continual hatred between the children of the woman and the children of the serpent. There would be a war between the children of God and the children of the devil. Let me repeat what I said a couple minutes ago. Our foundations reveal our destiny, but... They also reveal our parentage. Those who build on the rock of God's word by studying it and obeying it are children of God, seed of the women. Those who do not build on the rock of God's word are seed of the serpent. All who doubt, challenge, or counterdict God's word are children of the serpent. Every person in the world either follows God surrenders to him fully and seeks to live a life that's in harmony with his word or rejects God in some way and lives in harmony with the serpent, the children of wrath. And every institution, every nation, every church is either following God's word or they are following the enemy of God's word, the serpent. We are either children of God or we're children of the wicked one. The Bible is exceedingly clear on this and declares plainly that not every person in this world is a child of God. Not everyone will go to heaven, only the children of God. Notice what John the Baptist had to tell the leaders of the church in his day. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. What's a viper? A serpent. Brood of the snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Were they children of the serpent or were they children of the woman? Serpent. serpent. These were religious leaders. They were certain they were saved. They were certain they were children of God. But unknown to themselves, they were children of wrath, children of Satan. Notice what Jesus sadly exclaimed, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. They profess to be children of God, but their words revealed, betrayed their parentage. Their birth certificates proclaimed them to be the children of Abraham, but their actions revealed them to be the, the, that the serpent was their father. Jesus says, serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? You are of your father the devil, he said another time, and the desires of your father you want to do. And remember, dear folk, this was the words of Jesus from a heart filled with love. This wasn't some crank who had a bone to pick. This was the truth of God to the people he was speaking to. Jesus had to tell his, his disciples, did I not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. Today, would Jesus acknowledge me as his child? Who is my father? Who is my mother? 
The field, Jesus says, is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Jesus said, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Who is the mother of Jesus? Those, Jesus says, those who hear the word of God and do it. Who is the mother of Jesus, according to Jesus? Those who hear the word of God and do it. And in the Bible, that is what represents the woman. Those that hear the word of God and do it. That's Jesus' mother. Throughout the Bible, the sacred and enduring character of the relationship between Christ and his church is represented by the union of marriage. The Lord has joined his people to himself by a solemn covenant. He promises to be their God, and they pledge on their, on their part to be his and his alone. Hosea 2.19, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. What a husband. Again, Jeremiah says, I, uh, speaking of God, I am married to you. He said to his people. And Paul uses the same symbol in the New Testament when he says, I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. To recap, the woman is used as a symbol for God's people, his church, while the serpent is used as a symbol for Satan. God's church is built on the sure foundation of God's word. It's the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, said Paul. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. It's the word of God. It's built upon. By contrast, the children of the serpent, even when they claim to be following God's word, take man's words as their final authority. As Paul says, they accept profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. It's called science. It's not a science. They explain away the plainest statements of Jehovah. In place of creation by God's word, on the basis of man's word, they accept evolution. 1 Timothy 4.3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Now Paul here is talking about end time Christians. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Man is exalted and commentaries of scholars carry more weight than the plain word of Scripture. Man's doings are exalted. Christians do what is right in their own eyes, choosing the church based not on God's commands, but on their own desires. They find a church that uh, okays their sins. But we should not miss an important detail in this symbolism. The woman is a mother, but the serpent is a father. The word woman representing the true church married to God is singular. There's only one mother. God set up the illustration of the Garden of Eden by getting Adam just one wife. Adam the father was, rep, was, uh, represented, was to represent God as the husband of one wife. Eve was to be a symbol for the church. Just as there is only one God, there was only one mother, one true church. I'm so glad for the Bible's clarity on this point. The serpent, however, is a father, and he fathers his seed through many religious organizations, many women. Thus, the illustration reveals that there can be virtually unlimited hosts of false religious organizations producing children of wrath, children of Satan, but only one true mother. God calls all unfaithful systems of worship harlots because they are mothers that are unfaithful to Jesus. Although harlots may call themselves true mothers, they're not. In fact, there's a church that boasts of being the mother church, but the Bible agrees that she's a mother. She's a mother church and calls her the mother of harlots. All these unfaithful religious organizations all are called Babylon in Scripture and in prophecy. Though the systems are false, God has his people scattered around in Babylon. And Jesus said he had other sheep which were not in his fold. He says, them also I must bring. They will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. 
He's gathering his people out of Babylon into one flock, one, sh- one fold, one shepherd. He calls his people out of Babylon into the true Jerusalem. His sheep hear his voice, he says. In this great gathering time, God is gathering his children into one family. And just ahead of us is an amazing time. Just as many of God's children are in Babylon, Satan has many of his children hiding in Jerusalem, hypocrites in Zion, pretending to be children of God. God is bringing circumstances to expose these frauds, and they will leave, just like Judas and others who followed Jesus for a time. They followed him for a time, but they left him. God's people who are still in Babylon will hear God's voice, recognize his voice. They will leave Babylon to join God's people. Jesus is gathering his people out of Babylon into one flock, one fold, one shepherd. And tonight is one of his calls for his people to leave mystic Babylon and join his flock to mystic Jerusalem. Jesus is calling us to be part of answering his prayer that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. He answers our prayers, will we answer his? Paul says there's one body and one spirit, even as you are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. In the days of Noah, there was just one ark of safety. There will be only one ark of safety at the end of time. Dear folk, don't you want to have the one mother, the one fold, and board the one ark? The Apostle John was shown the war between God's people, illustrated by the women and her children, and the dragon in his seed, the serpent, his children, to the close of time. And this vision is found in the very heart of Revelation, Revelation 12. Please listen. Listen closely, for the vision covers more than 6,000 years of history as it expands the story from the Garden of Eden. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood.
But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's quickly summarize what we just saw. The dragon began his attacks in the sky, but was cast out to the earth exactly what God said would happen to him. The dragon had enmity against the woman and her seed. He hated them. He went to war against them. Exactly what God had said after the Garden of Eden sin. Now we briefly look at the woman. After her sin, when Jesus found her in the Garden of Eden, she was ashamed and naked. But now she's transformed. Now she's clothed. No longer does she have a sense of shame. Her husband is God, and he, she is pregnant with his child, the Son of God. While the serpent has been cast down to the earth, she has been elevated from the earth and sits in heavenly places. Her son is out of the world, and Satan, cast down to this world, cannot touch him. Her garment of, garments of salvation, the robe of the Son of Righteousness, is not of this world. She can't make them, and Satan can't touch them. Her crown with its stars is out of the world. Satan can't touch it. In the Bible, what we walk on and stand on is symbolic of our possessions. God's people's possessions are out of this world too. Satan can't touch them. They may be poor in this world's goods, but they are rich in faith. Abraham's only possession on this earth was his burial ground. The Bible says God gave him no inheritance in it, that is the earth, not even enough to set his foot on. God's children are like Abraham. We mentioned the amazing transformation in this woman from naked to clothed, from ashamed to unashamed. What brought this great change to the woman? And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. God's people that the woman represents were forgiven of their sins by the blood of the Lamb. That blood that gave them forgiveness also cleansed them. No longer were they listening to the voice of the serpent. They were listening and obeying the Word of God. They were no longer encouraging others to disregard God's instruction, but telling them of the value of obedience. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And lastly, they were willing to sacrifice their lives. They surrendered everything they had and were to Jesus. They held back nothing. They were also happy to lay down their life for the one that laid down his life for them. They were overcomers of the certain serpent's deceptions. And lay down their lives, they did. For 1,260 years, they were hunted and slaughtered by the millions but they showed that it was better to die for Jesus than live for the devil. And despite the intense war against her, the woman emerges at the end still with three identifying characteristics. Remnant of the woman's children. It says uh, um, the remnant. What is a remnant? I went down to pick up some remnants of carpet when we lived in Dalton, Georgia. And this was simply the final piece of carpet from an original roll. The design, the colors at the end were the same that were the design and colors throughout. It must be like the first or it's not a remnant. Second, the remnant women, God's people at the end, She loves Jesus, for she keeps his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. And she is fulfilling Christ's gospel commission by teaching others to obey everything that Jesus has commanded, his commandments. And lastly, the remnant woman, the remnant church, has the testimony of Jesus, which an angel explained to the apostle John is the spirit of prophecy. From the beginning to the end, the true church has always had these three characteristics. They've always had a, been a fellowship. God's true church is always a fellowship of other children of God. They have been entrusted with the law and the prophets. It was the law and the prophets that separated Israel 
from the rest of the world. It was the law and the prophets that separated the early church from the rest of the world. And it separates God's people today. And God's people are commissioned to proclaim the everlasting gospel to the entire world. They seek to be true to God. And like John the Baptist was given a message to prepare for the first coming of Christ, the remnant have been given a message to prepare the world for the second coming of Christ. And that's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. This is God's final unifying movement, raised up by God to call people from every nation, every church, every denomination out of Babylon to unite with Zion. We're made up of Baptists and Presbyterians, Methodists and Catholics. God calls all people, all uniting to honor Jesus and keep his commandments. And God has confirmed this message by giving the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy to his remnant people. It was late winter, 2007. I was doing surgery when a nurse rushed into the room where I was doing surgery and exclaimed, Anna Nicole Smith just died. I had no idea who Anna Nicole Smith was and thought the nurse must be talking about one of my patients. What had I done? I didn't remember the name. When she saw my confusion, she exclaimed, she explained, Anna was an actress that married an 89-year-old billionaire who died four years after she married him. And so she inherited some money, and she had a young daughter, Danielle Lynn Burkhead, who might inherit a fortune, but there was a question. Who was her father? Despite the fact that a name was listed on the child's birth certificate as the father, four additional men claimed to be the actual father of the child. Who was the father? It would determine her inheritance. Lawsuits were filed. At last, DNA testing revealed the identity of the true father, and the girl did not receive the fortune for her inheritance. Who is your father? In the paternity question on this earth, we do DNA testing. We, uh, we do that to determine inheritance, possessions. But God has a DNA test. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest, John said. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. 1 John 5, 2 says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Dear folk, I want the paternity test to show that God is my father. Isn't that what you want? I wonder if uh, we could just sing this. As, um, um, I ask, um, I need to turn this off for a moment because we're... A fourth stanza and the final two stanzas. Please join us. Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in His bosom gather, nestling the North Star in heaven. Such a refuge there was given. God his own doth tend and nourish. In his holy love they flourish. From all evil things he spares them. In his mighty arms he bears them. Neither life nor death shall ever from the Lord his children sever. Unto them his grace he showeth, and the 
their sorrows all he knoweth. Join us. Praise the Lord in joyful numbers. Your protector never slumbers at the will of your defender. Every fall man must surrender. Though he giveth nor he taketh, God his children never forsaketh. In his loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. If you turn this, let's uh, bow our heads. If it's your decision, Lord, I want to put, found my life on God's word. I want to be in fellowship with others who also are founding their lives on this earth, on, the, on this word. I want to reject the opinions of men for the wisdom of God. I want to be proclaiming, telling others of the goodness of God and warning them of the events so soon to transpire getting out of Babylon and coming into Zion with its peace, out of Babylon with its confusion, with its anxiety. If that's your uh, decision, would you just say to God, Lord, take me, I want to be your child. Not worthy of it, but Jesus, I claim his blood. I want to, by the blood of the lamb, be an overcomer. I want to testify of God's goodness to those around me. Dear Lord, you know what each person has said. In their hearts, you see each heart. And I pray that you will help us to be truly converted. To have not just an outward form like the Jews did, not to have our religion and our prayers be outward, but to have the true inward Jesus in our hearts. Lord, we surrender everything. We need you. We trust you. We thank you for hearing this prayer and for answering it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>